very unpolished presentation, um, but it's very personal, and it's full of a lot of honesty. It was really, um, it was really a nice challenge. Thank you for setting that up, Josh, um, for being the instigator. Um, because I had to really take a look at something that I do all the time and figure out how to present it to people. Um, and in the course of thinking about that, I, I was like, I kept coming up against different um, barriers or obstacles. One was, who are you to give this presentation? Like, this is, and I came across a great Hunter S. Thompson quote. Do you know who Hunter, everybody knows who Hunter S. Thompson is? Yes. Um, he's a personal favorite of mine, partly because we're from the same hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, but he says basically, to give advice to a man who asks him asks what to do with his life implies something close to egomania. To presume to point a man in the right direction, an ultimate goal, to point with a trembling finger in the right direction is something only a fool would take upon himself. So, um, so I feel a little foolish in presenting this information, but I like you guys a lot, and I trust you, and I feel comfortable with you, um, and so I don't mind feeling a little bit foolish in front of you. And in the end, I really just hope that what I have to share is either inspiring to you in some way, um, enlightening to you somehow, uh, gives you courage, gives you, you know, whatever it is you need to feel like you are capable of opening any door you want to open, because you are. Um, so um, the other thing I should say is uh, the first part of the presentation is not so much about how to do this, but how to be, um, how to be the kind of person who gets doors open to them. So, um, so the first part of the presentation is that personal part I mentioned. Um, I'm going to take you on a little journey, um, which is the journey of me, <laughs> um, and my story of sort of learning um, some, some of the tough lessons that we all learn in life. Um, and, uh, and then the second part of the presentation I actually did um, put together some bullet points. So there's actual instruction here too. So if you're like, why is she telling us all this? Just sit tight. You will get some bullet points at the end of the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So how do we do it? So what kind of doors are we talking about? Um, yes, sure. We're talking about these doors. I love, oh, you're going to, by the way, this is a very badly designed presentation, <laughs> so um, I just give you some, some visual interest, but it's really crappy. And like last night late, I was like, this is the worst looking presentation I've ever created, um, and I've created some ugly presentations. I'm a writer, not a designer, um, but just, just bear with me. So, um, so yes, we are open, uh, talking about these doors, but for me, these are actually the more interesting doors that need to be opened um, in order to be the kind of person who attracts, um, who is magnetic, um, who gets involved with interesting projects. Um, so over here uh, we have William Blake, one of the great mystics. You, you're the mystical. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. um, so the doors of perception. Everybody knows where Jim Morrison got the name for the band, The Doors? It came from William Blake. I didn't know. Well, it came originally from William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is. Um, Aldo, uh, Aldous Huxley here wrote this book, The Doors of Perception, about um, drugs, about tripping. Um, and then Jim Morrison sort of picked up the string. So uh, now we're talking about opening doors because... Um, what occurred to me in thinking about this presentation was um, there's a lot of uh, life lessons that happen um, in the course of learning to open doors that um, if you don't go on this journey, you're not going to open doors of any significance, basically, is what, where we're headed. Um, so these are the doors I'm going to talk about first tonight. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through the narrow chinks of his cavern. Most of us live in this state, right? Most of us are living in a cavern and we're looking at the world through narrow chinks. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to be jumping, it may be a little awkward, I'm going to be jumping in this presentation between the extremely profound and the very superficial. 
um, or the very commercial. <laughs> so it's a little bit of an awkward um, juxtaposition, but this is the story of my life and career. It's like it's been awkward from the very beginning because <laughs> I'm constantly like living in this world and trying then and then also in the boardroom. Um, and it's, it's sort of more and more the case for a lot of people that a lot of the great teachings, a lot of what used to be considered like esoteric or sort of like out of left field is kind of landing, it's sort of parking itself right in the middle of our commercial, of all of our transactions in life, but also our commercial transactions. So, um, so. Um, I'm going to start here. Um, H is Hugo. There are a few characters that will appear throughout this presentation, and they're teachers of mine. I've had a lot of teachers, and um, he's a really important one, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this guy. But uh, So this is a question Hugo posed to me at one point in our work together, and he actually posed this question to me almost every time we met for three years. What is it that you want? And my, qu my answer was different all the time, depending on what was going on with me in that moment, on that day. Um, but this was very, very early in our relationship. It was maybe like a few weeks in. And he asked me what I want. And I don't even know where this answer came from exactly. I can't tell you the context, like what led up to this. But I said I want to have power. And he said, power is nothing more than having people listen when you speak. And that quote stuck with me because there was so much contained within it. Um, and basically, it took me years, and I'm still figuring out how to be the kind of person who has that kind of power. Who be, you know, how to be the kind of person who has something to say that people care to hear. So um, that's uh, sort of the journey that I embarked on. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought about these guys too. I mean, like this is a, a, a question that's been um, interesting to people through the ages, and I just pulled some of the biggies. But Dale Carnegie, this 1931, How to Win Flynn and Friends and Influence People. Um, so 1931, massive bestseller, like a phenomenon of a book. Um, still totally relevant today. Has anyone read it? Really, really great read. Um, lots of insight there. Um, getting to Yes, this is also a classic in the business world. This is 1981. <clears throat> Anybody read that one? Yeah? That's a, this is a great book, too. Um, and interesting to me, like, this is such an 80s book in a way. It's like very, like, how to position yourself. It's, it's all about power plays and um, strategies. It's kind of Machiavellian. It's like how to get your opponent to feel this way and how to sort of read between the lines and um, very 80s sort of in its uh, in the path of persuasion. And then this book I haven't read, um, it's called Without Their Permission. Have you read this? No? Um, so I like to talk about books I've never read. <laughs> um, what I understand is that <laughs> it is, uh, well, I just like the title, Without Their Permission. It's from, by the, the guy who founded Reddit. Um, and his point, as it was described to me, is that we now live in a world where you can get to anyone. Right? You can actually, you have access to anyone you want, which was not always the case. Um, so it's a very unique period in history. And so, you know, your powers of persuasion, in some ways it's easier than ever um, to get, to make your way to the people you need to reach um, to get to move your idea forward or for whatever reason. Um, but also, there are more people playing this game. I mean, this used to be the, you know, it's kind of like the old boys club or insider networks. You know, people were very hard to have access to. And now, um, not so hard to get access to them, it's really hard to get their attention. Um, so, moving on. Maybe. Um, so, so, on my own personal journey, um, this has been a big theme, and I think it's a really important theme for anyone who's interested in creating a deeper relationship with themselves and with other people, and sort of recognizing your place in the great network. So, dissolving the ego, and uh, we'll start here. I've got three chapters. Um, the first is about humility, cultivating humility. Um, the second, here's another problem um, to having doors open for you, is confusion. 
We live in a very confuse, confusing world and a very confused time. Um, and so a very important part of getting doors opened to you is being very clear about what you want um, and about uh, the way in which you ask it. And then the third barrier, I think, these days to having doors um, open to us is this, this is kind of like this insidious idea of value, which I would suggest should be replaced with purpose. Um, so I'll talk about what each of these means. The first chapter I want to cover, though, is this one about humility. Um, this is my book, actually. It's very well worn. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'll just tell you. So I picked up this book. Um, a lot of the, a lot of what has um, governed the way I operate in my own life is synchronicity. Um, I have a Hungarian mother-in-law who's like way out there, very superstitious, very old world, and she loves to tell the story of coming to the U.S. and starting to learn English. And the first time she heard the word synchronicity, there is no word in Hungarian for this phenomenon, and it just like it just like totally threw her for a loop. Like she was so thrilled to have a word for this thing that had also governed so much of how she lived her life. So. Um, so paying attention, I think, is an enormous part of networking successfully um, and, and, and opening doors. So remember that tenacious magic and poisons and dreams you wanted to see, you bound your two eyes shut so as to see without knowing how to open the other. Well, the other is this one, right? Um, so looking within, just really critical. I mean. You're young. Most of you are very young, so self-awareness is probably something that, you know, you're sort of like, maybe you think you have it, but you're just coming into it. And as you get older, this is one of the beautiful things about getting older, you just get more and more. You just get to know yourself so well. You hate yourself sometimes, and then you love yourself more than you ever knew you could. Um, but I always, I can see when young people especially approach me for things, I just, there's such a lack of awareness sometimes about what their intention is or um, what they're trying to say or what they want out of the interaction. And I have a lot of compassion, so I usually entertain, you know, I can like work with someone to get to a place where I understand why we're sitting together. Um, but the more you look inside and the more you cultivate the, uh, you know, this ability to see what's really going on in the world, the better you will be, uh, the more successful you will be at making connections, um, at being clear about what you want, what you're trying to get, um, what other people want, also very useful. Um, and I'm going to start um, my story at a time when I had very little of this <laughs> inner vision, um, 10 years ago. That's me and Andre 3000. Um, <laughs> so 10 years ago, um, I was working in advertising at a big advertising agency, and um, I was a hot shot. I was a real hot shot. And um, I had a partner who's now, right now, this week on the cover of Ad Week, Ryan Berger. Anyone look at Ad Week? So Ryan and I, um, basically, our function at the agency was to make our products famous. So to take any of our clients' products, and 2003, if you remember, it was like when Paris Hilton was very famous, and Nicole Richie, and we were having this big moment of um, people, like product endorsement, like celebrities holding bottles, and you know, paparazzi shots of celebrity, like basically whatever a celebrity had on their person, like whatever they were wearing, doing, the restaurants where they ate, like we were all obsessed with celebrities. So. Um, this was our first big break. Ryan, Ryan and I ran the buzz. We started the buzz marketing department at this advertising agency. Um, and Polaroid was our client. So the company was dying, a slow death. They'd actually just, um, they were in bankruptcy. And for, <laughs> talk about synchronicity. So we were brainstorming about what to do with Polaroid, and we're like, oh, but Polaroids are so cool, and you know, art school students love Polaroids, and the fashion world loves Polaroid. And somebody we were brainstorming with was like, wait a minute, I think there's a song that has Polaroid in it right now. We're like, oh, that's so weird. 
So um, they were making the video. This guy was like, just happened to know that they were making the video for Hey Ya. And um, so Ryan and I were like, we've got, this is it. Like, this is, this is the moment. So um, nobody knew the song yet. Outkast was still just like a niche hip hop band from the South kind of thing. And um, so we threw connections, and I guess this is kind of like where I start. So opening doors, this is one way to do it. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we found out through friends at a magazine, at a music magazine, who the manager was for Outkast. So we couldn't get to Outkast, but we could get to their manager. And so we called and we emailed this guy, Blue. Um, and no response, no response, no response. And somehow, I don't remember how, we found out he was eating at Mr. Chow's one night. <laughs> Mr. Chow's was a very big deal in those days. So we went to Mr. Chow's and we hung out at the bar for hours while, and we didn't even know, we actually didn't know who Blue was. Um, and there were a lot of hip hop people in Mr. Chow's at the time. So we were like asking, like anytime a group of them would leave, we'd be like, is that Blue? Is that Blue? Um, <laughs> So we found Blue eventually and um, ended up partying with them very late into the evening, which was a requirement and um, part of the job description, and did a deal, basically, long story short, we spent that year as the song just blew up, like we had no idea how big it would be, um, throwing parties for Outkast, Hollywood Hills, the Grammys, the VH1 Awards, like we were with them at every party for a year. Sundance, we were just like attached to the hip. Um, so that was a really funny thing for me. So <laughs> that, that ended up um, opening a lot of doors. Um, so knowing a celebrity is really a good way to open doors. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, but what ended up happening was really a weird, weird, wild experience because it felt very surreal. Um, I ended up uh, one New Year's Eve, I think it must have been 2004, um, with Nikki Hilton and Paris Hilton, and I taught Nikki Hilton how to text. <laughs> so, um, but I will tell you something, and, and I think, you know, part of this was my curiosity about this world, this world, like how to gain access into this world. And I did it. Um, so VIP rooms, Marquee was a big club in those days. It's like, I had access. Like, I got there. Um, but it was awful. It was absolutely miserable. And it was a pivotal moment in my own career. Um, and what I learned from that experience was, yes, I could have open doors. At that moment, I could open any door I wanted, really. I was on TV. Um, you know, it's like, it was a very big moment for me in my career, but it was also a turning point. Um, so what I understood was that I'm gaining this power, but I don't like how I'm using it at all. I would come home from these parties and cry, actually. I really felt like my soul was getting sucked out of my body. I, I really hated what I was doing, so I quit. Um, so I went to my boss, out of nowhere in his mind, at like the pinnacle of my career, and said, uh, I quit. He said, where are you going? I mean, he assumed I had been poached by a competitive agency. And I said, nowhere. That was my answer. And he said, just tell me. It's okay, I can handle it. And I said, no, really, nowhere. Um, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. Um, so this is basically what my life looked like for a little while. <laughs> That's the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Very dark, dark <laughs> time. Um, no, but it was also extremely liberating. I mean, I literally stepped. Like, one night I was at Sundance driving Nicole Richie around, and the next I was nobody. Like, absolutely no, well, maybe it was a couple months, but, um, but really, I sort of like cast myself into the wilderness, um, and it was a scary thing. So uh, I fell off the grid. I actually wrote a blog post in those days, uh, those early days, which I tried to find, um, but I can't find some of my early blog posts, and it was called Off the Grid. And it was, it was sort of a, it was the ego dissolving, let me tell you that much. So, um, and this is actually, the, <laughs> this is a painting I did, a dream I had in those times, yes, of swimming with a beast um, in the woods. It's actually 
I like the moonlight coming through the trees, same thing. Um, so, so I was sort of lost. I started my own company. This is 2005. And, um, and my idea was I was only going to work for good. Like I was only going to work with companies that did good things, only had with you know people who were on a mission to do good in the world. And believe it or not, like it, it's not that long ago, but people were incredibly, incredibly um, dismissive. 2005, nobody wanted to hear it. They thought it was absolutely ridiculous, idealistic, stupid. <laughs> um, and so I went broke. Um, I was like sitting on these like values that I didn't quite understand. And I was getting jobs, I was getting calls to do jobs by, you know, big companies, the companies I'd worked for for a long time. Nestle and Levi's and other companies, and I was like, no, I can't work for you anymore. So, um, so I was in the woods, basically. Um, and, um, and I shut a lot of doors. I really, I closed doors on friends, I closed doors on clients, um, and I had a dream. Okay, and I was thinking I should get out of marketing altogether. Uh, and I don't know what I was going to do. I think I was going to become a psychologist or something. But anyway, so I had a dream one night, a prophetic dream, which um, in the dream, uh, there was a town, and there was a billboard up above the town. And um, this sounds like Dr. Seuss' story, actually. <laughs> and um, the, there were products being advertised on this billboard above the town. And whatever the product was, it influenced the town to such a degree that the people would become sick from the influence of the ad on this one particular billboard that was just like, it was controlling the people of the town. And the message is the town was just like sick and destroyed and it was like advertising like running shoes and bubble gum and like crap, 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 and the people were getting sick. And there was one man, so somebody, a, a man from the town journeyed out and he came back and when he came back, he was glowing. He was transformed. He was literally like a being of light. And I, so I was like, my God, where have you been? I can't be like, you're not sick anymore. What's going on? Have you become a doctor? I think I said to him, and he said, no, I'm in advertising. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he said, yes, I figured out that you can still be in advertising, but what you put on the billboard really matters. So, I mean, and then I woke up. This was my dream. Like, this is crazy. This is a little bit, like, it's kind of, um, they say dreams are a personal mythology. Mine's a little cheesy, my personal <laughs> mythology. But anyway, it was enough to keep me on the marketing track. So here I am. So I'm still doing marketing, which I'm really grateful uh, for. I'm really glad that I'm still here doing this. So I had to figure out how to start opening doors into um, a world, not yet, not yet, um, into a world that I cared to open doors into. And I didn't really have connections. I didn't know who I was trying to get to anymore. Um, the celebrity world is one thing. It's very clear who's at the top, who's famous, who's had, who has the power. Um, but I didn't know who had the power in this new world, I and mean, I didn't even know what kind of power I was seeking. Um, still, so I was confused. Um, and so this next piece of the puzzle, or the, the story, is about gaining clarity. Again, Renee, uh, Renee and all. Um, it's still enough for language to have clarity, and it's still not enough for it to have clarity in content. It must also have a goal and an imperative. Otherwise, from language we descend to chatter, from chatter to babble, and from babble to confusion. Um, so even though I had figured out that I didn't want to be opening doors into this particular world and I wanted to be doing good, that was a, a good a step in the right direction, uh, I still was confused, very, very confused on many, many levels. So um, I couldn't articulate what I wanted to do. I just, it was a sense, maybe you guys identify with this a little bit, it was like a calling, but I couldn't like bring other people into my vision because I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know what to say. Okay, so around this time I met a man, um, Hugo, and um, Hugo is a very interesting character. He has four rules for engagement. These are the four rules. So here, what I knew of him was that he was an executive coach at a very, very high level, basically for celebrities, 
um, hedge fund managers, like top of the top of Wall Street, um, many famous people who you guys know very well, who I will not name here because he doesn't like to talk about it, um, have been students of Hugo's. And it doesn't matter whether you're a hedge fund manager or a talk show host, these are his four rules for starting the engagement with him. And he takes them very seriously. Can anyone guess what these four rules are about? Language. How to express. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. She said language and how you express yourself. Um, so, yes. It's about language and how you express yourself, um, both outwardly and also inwardly. Right. So, um, yeah, so my first meeting with him, um, and, and actually what happened is sort of instructive it also in terms of opening doors. Um, I was invited to a talk that he gave at Flavor Pill. Anybody know Flavor Pill? Um, a friend of a friend, so I went to this talk, and what he said really touched me. And so I wrote a blog entry. And for me, what I've learned over the years, my writing is a really, is a strong tool for opening doors. Um, so you have a tool for opening doors. For some of you, it's art. For some of you, it's painting, drawing. Some of you, it's writing. Some of you, it's your personal charisma. Like, whatever it is, when you figure it out, you're really going to be shocked at how it works for you. But for me, it's writing. And it's interesting that one of the most significant figures in my life came to me because of something that I wrote. So I wrote a blog. Nobody read my blog. Nobody still reads my blog. But <laughs> fine. I don't care. Um, but in those days, like, nobody read my blog, so I'm not even sure how. I think probably a dear friend forwarded it to him. But anyway, he read what I wrote, and he wrote me a note and said, um, I need your help. Um, I, I don't know what, how to talk about what I do, so let's meet for tea, and if you can help me figure out how to talk about my work, then I'll coach you. And this is like $400 an hour kind of coaching guy, so um, I thought that was a great trade, right? So I engaged with him, and, um, and he, at our first meeting, he gave me the rules, and he stressed number four for me. Um, other people have problems with some of the others. But for several weeks, this was, this was all of the work. This is all I did. And I did it, I'll tell you, I mean, Naila, you talked about, we've talked about your consciousness exercises. Um, when you really try to institute these, you will be shocked at how self-aware you become. So um, it also takes you very far outside of the norm of conversation. Um, you can lose friends this way, especially in the workplace where something like gossip, for example, is if you are in an environment where there's a lot of gossip and you stop gossiping, you want to talk about hostile, people get angry about it. They will try to lure you back into doing it. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have a client that's a big PR company and their, their culture is very gossipy. They're always teasing each other and they gossip a lot and I always, I never do it. And one of the women calls me the mysterious girl. <laughs> She's like, you're so mysterious. You're our mystery woman. <laughs> so she's like, it's really, she's trying to get me to yeah. gossip. She's trying to get me to say, oh, you know what I did last night or what? And I'm not having it. And it's really, it makes her very uncomfortable. Um, and still she keeps calling me to come back and work for them. So, um, so anyway, these are the rules. Um, and this is what eventually Hugo said to me when, you know, so we went through, I basically did like a, a bunch of interviews with his clients, like I did a project for him. Um, but the way he articulated it in the end was really the best. After three years, this was, this is the experience I have with him. I have a talent for helping people begin to see. Um, and the anecdote I want to give about this because, and I, I tell you this story because it shocked me when it happened and, um, and I think it's like really important to know the level of insight you're, we're all capable of um, and we don't use most of the time. So I met with Hugo every Monday morning at 11 o'clock every week. So every week I would go from Brooklyn, take the subway, Upper East Side, Manhattan, beautiful Madison Avenue. I walk into his building, he's a doorman, so I always say, hey, he'd always be like, oh, what's your name? I know your name. 
for three years, like he finally got my name. Um, but so we'd have this interaction and then I'd call up, yeah, I'd get approved, and then I'd get in the elevator and go up and knock on the door and then we'd sit down and start talking. And, um, and during this time I was doing a lot of these exercises like this, no cursing, no gossiping, etc. And then there were others, there was just all these exercises about self-awareness. And finally about six months into this, one day I was walking up to the door and I noticed the lions. This isn't really the door, this is clip art. Um, but on the door there were these beautiful wrought iron lions. And I had started to see lions everywhere. And so all of a sudden these lions were in my face. And I thought, oh my God, I've never noticed these lions. And I walked into the lobby and I was like, what is this place? Like, this is so beautiful. And I noticed that the, the walls were marbleized and the columns were, I mean, it was like I had never been there before. And, um, and I walked in, I'm like in the elevator, <laughs> and I smelled, like the elevator smelled amazing. And, um, <laughs> and, and I sat down and I said, a, there are lions on the front door to the building. I'm seeing lions everywhere, there are lions. And he said, ah, so you have begun to see. It's very mysterious. He's a mystery man. So, <laughs> but really, I was like, oh, and the, the answer was perfect because it wasn't like, oh yeah, the lions are great. Aren't they great? Yeah, don't you like the lions? Yeah, lions. He just was like, boom. Like he saw what had happened. He was like, pointed out to me that I'd been coming there for six months and I had never even looked around. So, um, so that, <laughs> that, God willing, will happen to you one day too. Um, but one of the beautiful things that happened for me with Hugo is so we, we, you know, we started this coaching barter relationship and he's from Israel so his English isn't great and this is part of why he speaks in like three word sentences. Um, so, but he wants to write a lot of letters like this is someone he has his own plans in the world and he has projects that he's working on and he needs doors open. And like, I don't know, it was like six months in and I was going to pull up the, the email exchange um, but it's kind of lengthy, and um, but he said to me, okay, I need you to write a letter to George Soros. And I was like, oh my God. So, <laughs> um, so I went out and bought a book, a book on George Soros, like I started researching, et cetera, et cetera, and we worked on this letter for a long, long time. But what was happening was, like, I don't remember what happened with the letter to George Soros. I don't know if he ever sent it. Um, but I was learning how to communicate with like the utmost clarity. And he, Hugo was like an eagle eye. So I would send him a draft, and even though, and maybe because English isn't his first language, he would just hone in on particular words that were too, too much or misstating the case. Everything I wrote was too much, for, too flowery for him. I notice it all the time in emails I get from people, they're really long and they're lots of adjectives and lots of like, you're really trying to convince someone to pay attention when really the, like, the clearer and the more concise you can be, the better. So the letters I wrote, whenever I wrote a letter there was a lengthy draft and I was always like, oh god, it's so beautiful. And then I would send it to Hugo and he'd be like, I edited it a little bit and it would be like, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So, so there was that, and then I'll just another um, funny little anecdote about um, about our interaction and what I was learning at this time. Um, he asked me one day to do the message, the outgoing message on his voicemail, and <laughs> I was like panicked about it because isn't that awkward? Like I, I don't like doing it from my own phone. I don't like to hear my voice. <coughs> um, and so we sat in this office. And someone described once to me, they said, it's like sitting in a cage with a lion, being in the room with him, because he's so hyper aware. And so we're sitting in this tiny room, and he's like, yeah, 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 just, I have a new phone, I need you to record, I can't do it because no one understands me. So I'm like, okay. I like pull the chair over, I'm like, all right, what do you want me to say? I'm writing it all down, I'm like, okay. Cord, I mean, like, it was a huge deal, and I pushed the chair back and like, so right. he's like, it's just a phone message. Like the whole thing, he's like, why was that such a big deal? Like he watched the whole thing, and he wanted to point out to me how I made the tiny, like I could have just been like, sure, he's not here right now, leave a message, he'll call you back, thanks. 
but for me it was fraught with all this stuff. And it was such a, I was humiliated. I walked out of there like, oh my god, I'm such a loser. <laughs> <laughs> and I still, actually, I think it's still the outgoing message for him. And whenever I hear it, I'm like, oh, that was a horrible day. That was an awful exercise. Like, me coming in, like, face to face with how stupid I sounded and how hard I was trying for, this, like, the smallest thing. So, um, and breaking rule number four, worrying. Worrying. Yes, thank you, Josh. <laughs> so he sent me to, um, uh, he gave me a test, basically. Um, and what was happening at this time is like the more I was beginning to see and the clearer I was get about, uh, getting about language and the power of words and my internal and my external language, I was starting to like kind of freak out in the world a little bit. Like all of a sudden, it's like I was hyper aware. That's the problem. I was hyper aware of language. And so one of his big clients was this huge banker um, at Morgan Stanley. This is not him. These are like European bankers. I don't know what they are. But anyway, <laughs> essentially, so I went to Morgan Stanley and I always had a thing about money, about finance. This was one of the things we worked on, we were always working on. It's like, I had a bohemian idea about money being bad, and he's from Israel, so he's like, in my country even the artists want to make money. I don't understand what the problem is. So he was constantly t challenging me to become more comfortable at a very high level with money. So I went to Morgan Stanley to meet with this guy, and this guy like needed marketing materials for his group. And <laughs> it was basically like this. And I came prepared with my usual questions about audience and, you know, what's the feel of your brand? Like, there were all these questions that I was used to asking clients. And these guys were, like, not having any of it. First of all, they had no time for me. Um, and then they also, it's like, I would ask a question, like, who's your audience? So, like, people with money. And I'm like, right, okay, but there are a lot of people with money. Like, is it more like Hollywood, like artists, or... What? They're like, people with a lot of money. That was the actual <laughs> answer. <laughs> they were like, I don't care. I was like, usually I try to make a profile of the audience so that we can target them better. And they're like, I don't care who they are. It was annoying. Like, we were having, like, I could not. It was the first time I really could not connect, and I was getting a little desperate. I was scared in the middle of the meeting. So I got scared, and they then started talking. They're like, this is what we need. And they pulled out these like terrible brochures, and they're like, I don't even know. And we, I was there for an hour, and I cannot, I have no idea. Like, at one point, I was like, are they speaking a different language? Like, I really, it was an out-of-body experience. And so I went back to Hugo, um, and I was, like, really embarrassed because this was a client of his, and he'd made the introduction, and I really wanted to please and do a good job, and I had failed miserably. I did not get that job. Um, and he sat and listened to the whole story, and, uh, and then he said they didn't know what they were talking about. And what he had sent me to see was what jargon sounds like when you're actually hearing. And we had a very instructive conversation, and he was right. I went back over it in my head, and I realized the reason I could not understand these men at all is because they were not saying anything. <laughs> Nothing! It was like derivatives and da 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 da. Like they were literally speaking empty words, and I was just in this hyper alert state where I was hearing the emptiness and it was freaking me out. So, um, to make it up to me, <laughs> he sent me to another client. Um, <laughs> was this a test? You know, you know, you make your own stories, right? Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is how, like, I don't know, but this is how I felt. Um, but I always feel like I'm being tested. It's kind of a good way to go. No, it's good. It's good. It's a good way to go through life. Um, so, so he sent me to another client, this guy who owns um, one of the biggest moving companies in New York City. And this guy, what's that? Moishi? No. Moishi's mover? Yeah. Flat rate. Ah. So, flat rate, um, the CEO of Flatrate is this guy, Sharon. Um, he, this guy is an, incre he's a, he is an incredible, incredible man. Um, and also, 
like an incredible businessman and just like a pure joy to be around. But the thing that was most important to me, and I ended up working on a project for Sharon for a year and a half, and we built a startup, and we had this incredible experience. It really, um, it opened a lot of doors for me. We went to Pivotal, if anybody knows anything about the tech world. Like this was, I, I got a, a full immersion into agile workflow and the whole like tech scene um, through Sharon. But the thing about Sharon was he was so clear his vision was so clear that I got it every time he spoke. I knew exactly, everybody in the room, but for me, because I was doing a lot of the writing again for him, so I was writing the messaging, I wrote the websites, I was writing a lot of things. Um, he, like he had to say, like he said so few words, he said so little, and then I would write it, and he'd be like, That's it. yes. So we had this thing, and it wasn't just me and Sharon, it was for me, it was like, this is a man who is using his words so clearly that there are no barriers between me and him and understanding and vision, um, his vision so clear. So I was really starting to understand what clear speech sounds like and what unclear speech sounds like. And it was really, um, as I said, a very freaky experience. Um, and <laughs> what ended up happening was I got really, like, I couldn't talk for a little while. Um, one day he said, why don't you speak? I, I, would, I would sit in there and not be able to talk. And this would happen with friends, too. I would go out to dinner with friends during this period, and they would be like, How, how's it going? And I'm like, ah, uh, I, I don't, I can't, because uh, I couldn't say anything that didn't have actual meaning. Um, so I said to him that day, I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing. And he said, I, he said, I say the wrong thing time, ten times a day. And this was important to me because, um, you know, when I, when I talk about clarity, and later when I give examples of when you reach out to people, or when, you can make mistakes, okay? Because if you're terrified of not being clear enough, maybe you'll never reach out to people. You can make mistakes, but the <coughs> thing is to have a very clear intention, and then just be aware of what you're saying, and if they're not getting it, okay, let's try again in a different way. All right, all right, all right. So this led up a little bit of the pressure on being perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's just about having meaning um, behind the words. So as I started to master this, something funny started to happen, or not so funny maybe, but very important, and that was that I started to make people cry. Um, so <laughs> it happened one morning. I went out to breakfast. Again, I was like still trying to pursue this, overcome this uh, thing I had about money. And so... Um, I invited one of my good friends to breakfast, and her now husband was a big Goldman Sachs banker. So I said, okay, I've got to, like, I need to um, talk to Matt because I think I would like to work with Goldman Sachs. Um, I want them as a client, and I need to get some insight. And so we sat down to breakfast, and this guy was very intimidating. And, um, and he talked, we talked like for 45 minutes about whatever. And then the words came to me. Like, I actually got the courage to tell him, honestly, what I wanted. I want to work with Goldman Sachs. I, this is why I want to work with Goldman Sachs. This is what I believe. This is what's wrong with banking. This is what, I, you know, I believe banking can be noble. I gave a speech from the heart. And he started crying. Right there in the restaurant <laughs> at Balthazar, Matt <laughs> was crying. <laughs> Not like crying, crying, but like, tears. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's not like that my speech was really that good or anything, but I knew what was happening was that I was touching his heart. Like, we were actually having a connection. And so, like, with any skill, you know, with any talent, you have to play with it a lot. And you're going to get a lot of things wrong. So, this whole period, and this isn't uh, several many years, some of these things were very mysterious to me, and then some of them, like, sometimes I could make people cry, and sometimes I couldn't, no. Um, but it was interesting to me. I was just observing. I was just sort of learning what is possible. So I think about this all the time, and I actually do know I've hit the mark when someone starts tearing up, and it happens more often than you think. And sometimes I cry, too, so the crying is all good. Um, and one thing I'll say about crying, too, is that, um, for me, a big part of my mission, which I'll get into in a minute, uh, these days, is bringing the language of the heart into business. We're very much about the language of the head in business. Like, it's all about being smart and having the answers 
and think, 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 thinking things through. But this is actually what needs to be a part of business. And when you hit this, that's what happens. You can't make someone cry here. I mean, if you think about it, like that's never happened. So, um, so there you go. Um, so this is just to say, to close this section, that yes, you know, you go into the woods, you find your way out, and if you're if you're good and you're lucky and you're persistent and you're brave and all these other things and you're willing to be awkward um, and you're willing to be freaked out and you're willing to be open, um, you will come out of the woods with a treasure, okay, a talent or a something, uh, which is where value comes in because when you have a treasure. Um, suddenly people want it, or you want to give it. Um, but what's really important is that you figure out why you have it and what you're supposed to do with it. So um, this is Emerson. The one thing in the world of value is the active soul. At this every man is entitled to, this every man contains within him, although in almost all men obstructed and as yet unborn, the soul active sees absolute truth and utters truth or creates. Um, so this is, I think, really the goal. I mean, I know this is a talk about networking, but this is this is how you like you'd be a great networker if you can activate your soul. Um, <laughs> so we come back to the door. So suddenly, like, I knew which door to walk through, and I kind of knew that I did have a power um, to use when I walked through that door. <clears throat> Again, Joseph Campbell, um, the great. So there's a story he tells in um, The Power of Myth about there being two columns in Buddhism, and your goal, basically, um, is to get through them, is to cross the threshold. But one column is desire, and the other is fear. And if you harbor any fear or desire, you're not getting through. So you keep, <laughs> you go for it, and then, you know, you push back, and then you go for it again, and it, and you just keep learning over and over again where your desire is and where your fear is. Um, and I think what's really important about this is um, when you can operate and when you can make requests from that place beyond fear and desire, you, your, your doors are going to open, all kinds of doors open suddenly. I mean, he says it himself, the world will step in and help. So this is kind of like on a very high level, the goal is to get between those pillars, right? Um, but on a small level, too, is conquering, like, knowing why you're asking people for help. Okay, I see it all the time, requests that come out of, come from fear. Um, fear that I'm going to get rejected. Fear that um, I'm not good enough. Or fear that, you know, whatever the fear is. And then desire, grasping, attachment. Like, you know, also, like, I want, I want to get there. You know, how can you help me get to this person? Like, why do you want to get where you want to get? Like, you really have to have a clear idea about that. Um, just so you know, because you guys may not know, and probably you don't even know what I actually do, and if you don't, we can, I can tell you. But, um, but basically, my purpose is to rescue communication and make actual contact in, with and between people, and to facilitate a change in business by supplementing the dominant language of the head with the forgotten language of the heart. So I help people mean what they say and say what they mean, basically. But this has been written a thousand different ways. Like if you like this, it all I always write it differently, but the point is always the same. And as soon as I landed on this, doors started opening up. Okay, people, I know what I'm doing, and it doesn't sort of matter in a way. Like oh, now I know, and actually Hugo used to say, he used to say, ask for the right people to show up. And I think that's a really important part of networking, is that you have power. Okay? Ask for the people who show up to be the right people, for whatever it is your purpose is. But until you get to a point where you know, it's kind of hard, right? You're not sure who to ask for, exactly. Um, so having a mission is magnetic. It draws people to you. And I'm just going to share with you, um, this is another teacher, a different teacher, Gabrielle Roth. Um, anybody know Gabrielle Roth? Yeah? Do you dance? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so Gabrielle um, was uh, called the Urban Shaman. She's a mystic. She's amazing. She died last year. Um, I worked with her while she was living. Um, her books are incredible. Maps to Ecstasy is a great book. 
But before Gabrielle died, she had a, um, a message about the times that we're living in that were really important to her. So the five rhythms is the dance practice she created in the 70s. Um, and these are the, <coughs> are the rhythms. Still, no, let's go here. Flowing, staccato, chaos, lyrical stillness. So flowing is like the first rhythm. And this is, these are the rhythms that govern the universe, the world. Like anything, everything follows these rhythms in this order with the happening naturally. So flowing is the rhythm of the feet. It's about being grounded. It's about kind of like assessing your situation. It's like literally getting in your body. She says Michael Jordan was often flowing. Like everything's sort of one. You really got like, a, you kind of get the lay of the land in flowing. Um, staccato, the beat picks up. It's a very linear. It's a very, ma it's a masculine energy. Um, it's the energy of interacting one-on-one -on -one with someone. It's exchange. So a lot of our, City life is in staccato, like we're just like boom, boom, boom all day long. We're like, yeah, eh, 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 eh. you know, it's this kind of stuff. Um, moves into chaos. Chaos is um, the rhythm of letting go of the head. So chaos is like getting out of the head and into the body, um, and combining flowing with staccato and just like whew, letting things pass through you. Um, Lyrical is the place of ultimate creativity. It's a very beautiful place. She used to say um, Michael Jackson was often in lyrical, in a lyrical state. Just like so beautiful a place where things are just like cre being created out of you. And stillness is the last one. And if you think about, I mean, stillness is obvious, right? Um, but it's a communion with something greater, higher. So there's a very deep and very profound philosophy to her work, but um, the thing that's interesting to me as a cultural analyst is that Gabrielle talked a lot before her death because she felt it was important for people to understand that we have in the last few years moved as a, as a culture from uh, the linear staccato rhythms of like the 80s and 90s and early 2000s <coughs> to chaos. And that's fine. We're moving towards this, ultimately, could take thousands and thousands of years. As she said, we are living in a moment of transition, and it is so confusing. If you feel like your life has gotten more chaotic, it's not an accident. It actually has, and those people who can maneuver with chaos are going to thrive. And a lot of us are still hanging on to this. What worked in staccato is not going to work in chaos anymore. And she speaks really beautifully. So I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, I've got like a two-minute clip of Gabrielle um, talking that I want to share. Um, What's your last name? Roth. The, the important thing to realize is that chaos has two sides. It has a shadow side. And that's when it's not grounded, and that just is a panic. It's like living in a panic room. And if we're not careful, we're moving in the direction of living in a panic room because we are taking in so much information, and we're not grounding it, and we're holding it onto it. It's not passing through us. We're like, you know, we're like CNN headline back here. We have all kinds of data. We have so much data and so many things and so much to hold on to that it's imperative that we have a practice where we can remember how to let go, that we have a practice that we can remember our feet. If we're not in, if we're not at home in our own bodies and we're not in the instrument that's tuned in to all the changes, and so we're not picking up you know, our messages in the big chat room. We're so busy in that small little chat room picking up all these important um, messages. We're on a trip instead of a journey. You know, I think of David Byrne and the Talking Heads. It was like such a brilliant, title for a band because we had become and we have still the possibility of, of being talking heads, disconnected from our personal truth, disconnected from our personal power, disconnected from our centers, from our roots, from our ancestors, you know, disconnected from a divine intelligence, from source, from something bigger than us that drives us and moves us and holds us and rocks us and shapes us. We have become disconnected from the things that are valuable 
to us as human beings. What is it to be a human being? Human being, it's a motion, it's a dance, it's an energy, it's something spontaneous and brilliant and original. And we have lost that, and I say that we have to retrieve our souls. <laughs> That's Gabrielle. Oh my God. <laughs> and that was her son, by the way, um, who's continued the practice um, now that she's gone from this world. But, um, but I think, you know, the thing is, in a time of chaos, what's most important is that you are centered, that you have a center. And I'm finding more and more, it's like, people who are centered, people who have focus, are more magnetic than ever before. Because we're looking for something to grasp onto, right? We're looking for something to ground us in this time of chaos. So I think it's a really worthwhile thing to work on um, personally. Oh, wait, that's not going to work. Um, all right, so. So sum it up um, there. This is the end of the uh, um, journey part of the portion of the presentation, and now uh, I attempt to instruct you with some, um, <laughs> with some bullet points, um, and so I've created five. I've created five buckets, okay, take them or leave them. Um, again, horribly designed. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, anybody? Cat's Cradle, Bacchananism, are you familiar with the scene? fake religion. So um, I've always loved, since I was in like high school, the idea of the Grand Falloon and the Caress. Does anyone, is, or who's familiar with this? Okay. So um, so he invented, in Cat's Cradle, which is a great book, he invents a religion, Kurt Vonnegut, and it's really detailed. Like he really puts a lot into this religion. Um, but one of the primary um, teachings of this fake religion is that there's something called a grand falloon, and there's something called a carass. And a carass is basically a group of people or souls that you travel with through time. And you have the potential to help each other. Like, you basically are married to each other. And you lift each other up, and you help each other along, and that's your carass. A grand falloon is a fake carass, basically. It's the construct we put on our life to, to like... It's like, oh, I went to UVA, so you went to UVA, and oh, that means we're we're matched, like we're in the same family, and it doesn't work like that necessarily. So all the time we confuse grand falloons for carass. And so my point is, if you can figure out your carass a little bit, like you'll know when someone's in your carass, those are the people who you can call on for anything. And you, they come in the most, like they, they show up in the most unlikely of places. I think I met somebody in my carasses today at the Park Slope, Slope Food Co-op, like, all of a sudden, we're bagging nuts together, and this woman's 70 years old, and next thing I know, she's like, will you be my friend? I'm like, yes, I am your friend. Like, I made a friend at the co-op. And, um, and we were, like, instant, like, like, I knew this woman. So I'm not saying she's in my crass. I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah. I think it is important that we don't, like, for example, okay, so I went to a prestigious university, and I am not a part of the Alumni Association. Maybe stupid. Most networking professionals or experts would tell you that's stupid. But I don't care. I mean, the people I met at school who have resonance with me, I'm still in touch with. Um, so, you know, I think, like, it's helpful to monitoring your energy expenditure. Like, the better you get at understanding when you have simpatico with someone, the better you will be at getting to the, the goal. Um, and it's not, uh, I think the other thing is, is like, when people reach out to me or I meet, like, I take a lot of meetings with people. Maybe you guys, some of you have emailed me, and I'll help anyone who asks, most, if I can. Um, but I ha that means I often find myself sitting at breakfast or lunch with someone who I'm like, why are we here? Like, we have no, there's nothing going on between us. There's no connection. <laughs> And it's not personal, it doesn't mean that's a bad person or I'm a bad person, whatever. We just have nothing to do with each other. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes those people keep coming back to me. They're like, can we do it again? Can we have lunch again? And I'm like, no, because there's no 
there's no reason. I can just feel it. Um, and then other times, and I'll give you an example, I, I included an example in this presentation of a young man from Chicago who reached out to me, and we've become very good friends. He was a total stranger one day, and now he's a very good friend. So, um, uh, anyway, so make personal connections. Um, you know, whenever someone sends me, like, whenever you can make, uh, it's like name dropping, but in a very nice sense. If someone sends me a note and it's like so-and-so told me to reach out to you and that so-and-so means a lot to me, instantly they're like top of the list, right? That makes perfect sense. Um, but I do find myself when I'm trying to get to someone, like even if I have a really strong connection, I'm like, oh, it's so cheesy to say so-and-so. Like, I don't want to use that person's name or whatever, but it really, really makes a big difference. Um, call on your network, call on your friends. Um, Pay attention to synchronicities. So I don't know if this happens. I'm sure it happens for you, but you know, if you pay attention, it's like certain people will come up again and again, right? Sometimes it's like so obvious. It's like you're running into them um, in, on the street. You're like, oh my gosh, we should just have coffee because something's going on here. Um, and focus on resonance, like minds, people who are on the same trip with you, and do your homework. I love. Um, young people especially. I think it's funny, because I started networking before Google, um, I sometimes forget to Google people before I meet them. But, and it always blows my mind when like, I show up to a meeting with Micah and he's Googled every person. Like He went on the email list and like when we went to Seattle to see Microsoft, there were 15 people in the meeting and he had Googled every single one. And when one of them said, um, oh, I dropped out of college, Micah was like, ah, that's why I couldn't figure out where you went to school. And he, like, it was a funny, like, the guy that had this moment, and it was like, I have done my homework. Um, I think that's really, it shows a lot of respect. It shows that you care. Um, and then don't uh, confuse uh, a grand balloon for a grass. Um, and I think it's important also not to feel, like, sheepish about asking friends for recommendations. That's the other thing. I don't know. I'm going to offer it because I feel it sometimes. Like, I have some very well-connected friends, and... Sometimes I need something and I don't want to bother them, I don't want to ask them, but they're really happy to help most of the time. So, um, work your friends. Um, respectful compensation. <laughs> it's funny, the only person who's asked me yet if there's a compensation for doing this speaking engagement was Emily, the first speaker. Um, Probably she needs the money, you know, she runs a small nonprofit. She asked it in a really, really beautiful way, and I actually really wanted to give her money, but <laughs> we don't do that. Um, but no one else has asked yet, and um, if you saw the piece I posted from the New York Times about asking people to do things for free, yeah, it's becoming a little bit of an epidemic um, in, in this world without borders, you know, without their permission. Everyone's asking everyone to do things. Um, so, and this happens to me all the time when I'm doing research for clients. They're like, oh, the incentive is a really hard pill for a client to swallow. They don't want to give good incentives. It's like, you know, we're going out to talk to people in their homes, and I'm like, you've got to give them like $500 each. And that's very high for an incentive. But you're like, why don't we give them like $300 and like a gift certificate? And I'm like, no. We gotta really, you gotta show people that you value their time. So if you have access to money, that's always really helpful. <laughs> money is a great um, incentive. Um, if not, fine. Offer something of real value in exchange and know what you have to offer. So all the time I see people um, asking for help and not helping me see what I'm gonna get in exchange. Do you know what I mean? And I don't, I don't want money, you know. I just want to know, like, I, you know, I'll walk your dog. No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't have a dog. Um, but it is interesting to me, like, know what your assets are. Um, I think sometimes some of the people come here to talk because SBA is interesting. This program is prestigious. Like, what are, some of them have another agenda. It's like, oh, I want to get on Cheryl's radar or whatever it is. Like, we have, like, I'm having to figure out when I sell this gig to people what my gold is. I have no money to offer, so when I call people and I email them, I have to like really act like, and it's true, it's a very prestigious engagement, and um, and I always talk about you guys, I think I've told you this before, 
People love an engaged audience. They like young people who are curious and asking questions. And um, it makes the speaker feel alive, you know, and heard. And um, so I think that what you're providing, even just by sitting here in these seats, is really valuable. So you just have to know what it is you're offering. Um, be upfront about compensation. I see this all the time where people are like really skittish about mentioning money or not money or like they try to dance around the issue. Don't uh, be upfront. Um, believe you're selling gold. This was advice given to me when I was sort of like, I don't know if I should reach out to so and so about this project. It's like you have to believe you have got something they need a piece of. Um, so. And never take a bad job. I mean, that's really an important one, too. I've said no to many, many gigs because um, I couldn't sell it. And I didn't want to be associated with it. So I didn't want to reach out to my network on behalf of this client or whatever the request was. And so I'm not going to do it. Um, and please ask questions if any of them come if any, if they comes up. What was the, the head title for the first one before Respectable Company? Um, something about your Friends. Keep it in the family. Um, yeah, and I'll give an example too. I have two examples on this one. One is um, Cynthia Rowley, the fashion designer. So uh, she's funny. You never know who who wants the money. I did a project for Audi a couple of years ago on luxury, and I had to go find five very high-profile people who worked in the luxury industry to interview on camera. And she, I knew through uh, the glory days of 2003, <laughs> um, to the battle, back in the battle days. And so I reached out to her and I got a note from her assistant. I didn't offer an honorarium because I felt like it was insulting to these people because we didn't have enough to pay them what they, so it was more like just a, a plea to their um, expertise. And she wrote, her assistant wrote back and said, she'll do it for $750. And I was like, Audi, can you do that? They're like, sure, whatever. So, um, you know, there I thought I was going to insult her by offering money, and she had to come back and say, yeah, but I need to be paid. And so, yeah. Um, and then also I'll say, in this day and age, incentives, I think Kickstarter is a great example of like creative incentives. I mean, it's always so fun to me to see what people are offering. It can be any number of fun little things. People just like a little something. Um, um, it's the acknowledgement. Yeah. It's like it's, it's being gracious. Yeah. yeah. Or being heard or being, you know. But um, but I do think it's really, if you have money, it's a really good thing to offer people. Um, put everything on the table, almost. Secret intentions. Um, so this is kind of funny, but um, there's so often there are secret intentions to meetings. <laughs> and there are some that are okay. Like, let's say you want a job at a place, but you're not, like, ready to make that plea. You know, maybe you can finagle your way into a meeting somehow. But usually if you have a secret intention, it's going to be clear to a perceptive person. And it's better to just be out with it, okay? Um, so you have, first of all, you have to know your intentions. Sometimes people, I think people don't know what they're trying, what they really want. Um, so, but if you have them, reveal them, if they're appropriate. Um, <laughs> give people a chance to mean their yes or their no. So, um, if you're kind of like, I don't know, how many of you have been in like a situation where you were networking or you're like, I don't know, would you like read this thing for me? And they're like, yeah. Like everybody's kind of yesing and knowing, but no one's really, like you're sort of dancing around the issue. Like how much better to be like, I would like to work for you. I have been following your career. I'm really impressed by you. I have this document I've written. You know, would you mind reading it? Um, and, you know, just so they know where you're coming from. And then, if they're like, look, I could never hire this person, or I don't even want to lead you on, they could be like, you know what, I don't, no, I can't do that. Great, move on. Um, but this, like, when intentions aren't clear or stated, it's, it just, like, prolongs the agony. Um, and never ambush a person. So that happens to me all the time, that people ask me for just, like, just to go get coffee. And then all of a sudden, they're like, 
I need a green card. Can you just hire me to do some research for you? Like, this actually happened. So just don't ambush people. Like, if you need, if this is what you want, like, be upfront about it. That way I can say, no, I'm not going to even, like, let's not waste each other's time. I'm not going to do this. Um, yeah. Uh, persistence and acceptance. <laughs> so, um, this is a book I really hate reading to my daughter, <laughs> Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Dr. Seuss is really long. It's really funny, like, when you ha when you start reading kids' books every night. <laughs> you like, the ones that you like, like, have to have certain qualities, and the ones that I hate are, like, I thought I liked Dr. Seuss before I had to read it every night. But anyway, this is an extremely persistent guy in this book, We Made the Ham. <laughs> but his persistence pays off because the guy finally eats the green eggs and ham and he really likes it. So, um, but, you know, so this one was a little tricky. Don't take no for an answer. Um, tenacity is important. Have courage. Have faith. But also don't hound someone either. Like, definitely know when to walk away. And it seems obvious, but I think it's actually not so obvious in practice, this, rule, this, this whole uh, piece of advice. Because I've had situations in my own life that I was like, okay, so for example, probably the big break of my early career was working for this woman, Marion Salzman, who is legendary um, in the trends, the futurist world. And I wrote her so many letters before I ever met her, and none of them were answered. I mean, I was writing her emails and letters, and like, she moved to Amsterdam. Like, I tracked her down to different countries, and like, I, I stalked this woman, and then I finally was like sitting in front of her, and it was like, um, I didn't, I didn't give up, you know. I think, and and we ended up having a great working relationship for four years together. Um, so I think tenacity is really important, and you have to have courage and you have to have faith. But I'm going to give you an example of uh, somebody who didn't really, this is, a, this is a great example of what not to do, okay? Um, I hope nobody knows this person. Nothing personal against the person. I almost blacked out the name, but I was like, whatever. Um, so I got this email this summer. Hello. I know you do not know me, therefore I will keep this as short as possible. Look how long it is. <laughs> my name, I'm a 22-year-old student. I love students. I completed my fourth year. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so she starts talking about music. My dream is to one day own a studio and become the CEO of a record label. All right, cool. Maybe, you know, give me these gifts and mentor. Like she goes on and on. Graduation nears. It would greatly impact my life if I could re receive an opportunity to speak to you. A little bit overstated, right? She doesn't, I don't know who this person is. I took a chance and moved to New York for the summer to pursue this dream. I believe you have endured a journey I could... She didn't even see this presentation. Um, and my hope is that you could possibly find the time to speak to me and provide wise words that will assist me to strategically plan my future. Great, okay. Well, so it was a kind of a strange letter, but this is the kind of thing I usually say yes to. Because, whatever, it could be interesting. Um, but there's a record, uh, there's a recording studio in New York City called Skylab. So immediately I'm like, oh, she thinks I'm the recording studio. You know, she's like, music, music, music. So I wrote back and said, I think you may be trying to reach someone in the music industry, and I am not. Skylab is the name of my consulting business, but you might be looking for the music studio of the same name. Good luck. And she writes back, no, sir. I'm a double major. This is clearly text, like, typing. In marketing and advertising, I like to talk to you about real-world application of the concepts. And I say, I appreciate your outreach and admire your initiative. How do you know me? I'm still not sure you've reached the right person to start. If you check my website, you'd see I'm a woman. <laughs> There's a picture of me on my website. Okay? And it's not an androgynous photo. I look like a woman. So still, I don't know how this person found me. It's like, now I'm suspicious. I'm like, is this a scam? It was so weird. Um, so anyway, her response, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I was searching for marketing and advertising music people in New York. I came across your website and immediately contacted you. So now I know she hasn't read the website. She just found it somehow. Um, so she apologized. I sincerely apologized. Well, that got me back in. Um, um, 
Okay, no, no, that was it. No, no, that didn't get me back in yet. So I was like, okay, fine, whatever. I didn't respond. And then five days later, she writes again. I hope I did not offend you with my previous mistake. If you're still willing to meet, I would like to. So then I was like, oh, this poor girl. Like, she thinks she totally offended me. I really don't care. But, but at this point, I'm like, what? Who is this person? I'm spending too much time. And um, so I write back, and I'm like, you know, I didn't take offense. The fact is, I'm very busy, and I'm always happy to help if I can. Maybe we can talk by phone. Let's not meet. Let's just talk by phone. Um, next week is better, and then I never heard from her. So I went through this whole thing <laughs> with this person, and um, anyway, so I was just like, what not to do, right? Um, but I did, like, a couple of times her persistence paid off. Like, I stayed engaged, but she didn't know when to walk away. She walked away too soon. <laughs> so, um, so I have just one more, and this presentation is almost over, by the way. Um, but I'm just going to share with you one um, other video. Uh, this video it was made by a friend of mine, Kate Milliken, who um, is one of the best networkers I know. And she posted this video. She has MS, muscular, uh, dystro I mean, um, multiple sclerosis. sclerosis. And so she's been on a big campaign. She's um, started a business to help people with MS. But she posted this video on her Facebook page um, this summer, and I was really it really gave me great insight. I mean, this is a great story about networking um, in terms of per visualizing it and persistence. So um, let's just hear from Kate. And I'm not going to go the whole four minutes, but you, you'll get the gist. In college, I was a huge music fan, and one of my favorite bands who I loved was this band Fish. And the guitarist and lead singer's name was Trey Anastasio, and I thought he was remarkable. There were so many times where I would listen to his music or listen to his bootleg tapes, and I'd think, oh, I know exactly where he's going to go with his guitar solo. And then he'd go somewhere else, and I'd think, oh my god, this guy is amazing! I really began to feel this need to meet Trey. I had a camera in my car just in case Trey drove by or I imagined meeting him on an airplane and I, I just thought about it all the time. At one point when I was a senior in college, I wrote a letter to Trey. And in the letter I said, Dear Trey, I am a huge fan of yours and I have this image of you and me meeting at some point and we're going to take a picture together and you're going to be on my wall forever and I really hope this happens and until it does, It'd be really great if you could send me a guitar pick of yours, just so I could have like a little memento. Uh, that'd be really great. And I sent it to the Fish Fan Club, and I wrote to the Fish Fan Club, Dear Fish Fan Club, I'm sending this letter to Trey, and I really want you to give it to him. Like, don't screw around and give me a guitar pick that's like from a box. Like, I really want you to give it to Trey, otherwise you might as well just throw it in the garbage. Four months later, I'm at home on Christmas break, and I'm looking through the mail, and I see my own handwriting from a self-addressed stamped envelope. And on the from section, it says, from Trey, not screwing around. And I open it up, and, and Trey writes me a letter. And he says, hey, I got your letter. Thank you so much. Here's a pic that I used on my newest album. Hope you dig it. See you later, Trey. And I thought, wow. So I wrote Trey back, and I said, hey, Trey. You know, it's so awesome that you sent me that guitar pick because I'm at a point right now, my senior year, where everyone's figuring out what they want to do. I want to be an MTV DJ and everyone is telling me there's no way that that's possible. It's never going to happen. And every single person that saw me send that letter to you was like, there's no way that Trey's going to write you back. Like, no way. And now you've written me back. Fast forward to eight years later. I'm sitting on the tarmac at LaGuardia Airport at 9 in the morning. And by this point, Fish is huge. They're playing Madison Square Garden for five nights in a row. Uh, they're really, really well known. I'm sitting there reading a magazine, and the plane door is about to shut, and who walks out of the airplane? Exactly the way I dreamed for eight years. He <laughs> walks right by me, comes down the plane. The whole airplane is full, except for an empty seat next to him, and nobody recognizes who he is. So I am. I mean, it was such an unbelievable moment, and the plane takes off, and I look back, and Trey's asleep, and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to wake up Trey, but I thought, God, you know, I, it's all about the drink cart. Like, if the drink cart wakes this guy up, I'm going to go over and introduce myself and have that moment that I thought about. 
Sure enough, the drink cart comes by and Trey wakes up. And I think, oh my God. I get out of the chair and I'm walking down the aisle and everything goes in slow motion. And I go up to Trey and I say, can I have one minute of your time? And he looks kind of weary. And I say, uh, my name's Kate Miller. Does that ring a bell? And he went, the MTV VJ. Have you done it yet? And I thought, that is so awesome. And it was definitely one of the greatest life moments I've ever had. In light of the Trey experience, I started thinking, you know what? I thought about that every single day for eight years, and it worked out exactly the way I wanted it to. So why can't other things in my life, if I think about them every day, all the time, why can't that happen too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's an awesome girl. And, um, she, she is an, an incredible person, but what a great story, right? I was crying when I saw that. I was like, my God. But, you know, the, the thing that's, I mean, the thing, a couple of few things are important, and you will take away from that story what you will, but um, the persistence. And also, like, remember back to when you were a kid and you had those dreams of meeting mm -hmm. your heroes, like those really, like, and the, and the, the feeling that you might actually be able to do it. Like, I love that she acted on it, and and she got there, and it took time, but there was a real connection between them. I think there's so many lessons in that story. <coughs> yeah. So, um, and by the way, I, Kate Milliken is like one of these super, like, she's actually good at this with many people in her life, so um, she definitely walks the walk. All right, so we're almost coming into the home stretch here. Where am I? Um, oh, yeah, home stretch, number five, final one, gratitude. Again, feels obvious, but so seldom expressed. Um, be thankful, express your thanks. Like, it's not enough to just be thankful, actually tell people you're thankful. So um, a good example I have of this is in dancing. Um, so in this five rhythms class, you often have like a very good dance with someone. And at the end of the class, the teacher says, like, if you had a meaningful dance with somebody, tell them. And it's hard to do. It's weirdly hard to do because, you know, it's like we're in the dark and we're dancing and then the lights go on and everybody's like, then all of a sudden it's not magical anymore. But if you, and I've done this, like now it's like a, something I actually try to do. I go find that person that I had a good dance with and I say, that was really fun or that was incredible. And I, it's led to so many beautiful connections. And when people have done it for me, I'll tell you something, you don't often know when you we're making an impact on someone. Like, there have been people who I didn't even really notice, and they've come up to me afterwards and they've said, thank you so much. You know, I, I really, I needed, you know, you gave me something I needed. So it means a lot. That's how we're supporting each other. It's like letting each other know. Um, appreciate others, make friends early and often. Um, uh, love um, is just a really good um, thing to bring into anything you do, and then follow through. And I'm going to give you an example of follow through. Um, oh, hard to see. Um, so this is a correspondence. It's only one slide, so it's not like lengthy uh, like the other one. <laughs> but this is from Ankur, this guy who's become my friend. So, um, so the original introduction came through a mutual friend, Peter. And so I got this note from Peter that said, Ankur Skylar Skylar, Ankur Ankur Skylar is a dear friend, wonderful strategy living in New York City. She's always a person I think of when anyone inquires about work in the city. She knows the lay of the land really well. Skylar Ankur is a bright strategist, novelist, and he works in the mayor's office. Okay, so that was a great introduction. We're both complimented. We both feel really high, you know. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, so, uh, but this made me really pay attention to Ankur. Also, you know, back to that point I made about knowing what you have to offer. I mean, it sounds stupid, but the fact that he works in the mayor's office is really interesting to me. That's a good detail, because that could come in handy um, one day. Um, Hi, Skylar. Pleased to meet you. I talked to Peter a bit today, and as he wrote, I'd love to come back home to New York. I'm currently looking at various positions in the nonprofit world, newspapers, and a few agencies. I'd love to jump on the phone sometime next week, as your time allows, to talk about your work and hear your thoughts on my search. Let me know if you're interested or available. So, just compare for a minute this note. It's like four sentences um, to the one, the other one. Like, this was beautiful. And yes, he already had, the, the door was open, partly, but... It didn't take me any time to read this. I totally understood he's in Chicago, he wants to come to New York, 
this is the kind of work he wants to do. I know about that kind of work. Um, and then all of the, the, the nice little nods to me, like, as your time allows, let me know if you're interested and available. Like, I just felt like this isn't a guy who's going to be really easy to help. He's going to be quick. He's going to get it. Um, and he's not going to waste my time. That's what he's demonstrating by writing me a short letter. So, um, so we met. And we had a great meeting. Um, oh, no, actually, uh, whatever. I hooked him up with some people in the city even before we met. Like, all of a sudden, like, I was, like, broker. He had interviews. Um, and then um, he had a, uh, oh, wait, 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 what happened? Oh, so we talked. Sorry, hold on, I jumped ahead. So we talked. I want to thank you again for talking to me last week. Your insights and suggestions were all pretty amazing. I took the weekend to do a spot of research and wanted to follow up. So this is like, I told him about some places he might want to look into. First of all, Flavor Pill is looking for a social media director, which is pretty much a dream job. So he went on their site, he looked at whether they had jobs posted, like I was loving this already. Um, I sent my resume in their system and I'm learning about Sasha and Mark's careers. Like that is so cool, Sasha and Mark are my friends. So back to the point about doing your homework and your research, like this was so endearing to me. Um, I also really liked Undercurrent. Your assessment was spot on. It's no wonder they're just, they're just a great aggregator, launching pad for people who get it. I'd love to connect with Josh if possible. Again, a friend, and I feel like, okay, I can open that door for him. I've also been learning about Rachel Tipograph. She's so fierce. I love the personality in that. Um, matter, a great fit for the commitment to CSR, Area 17, my kind of elitism, and huge, which impressed me by being so committed to workplace development. Like, look at the insights he's sharing. Like, it's really beautiful. He, like, really condensed. So, I mean, how many times, like, I, I'll tell you, when I'm talking to someone like this in a face-to-face -face setting and they're not taking notes, that really bothers me, okay? You can take them on your phone or, like, if I'm saying, oh, you should look into undercurrent, huge, matter, Rachel Tipograph, like, I gave him a wealth of leads, and he took notes, and then he went on to do this. Thanks so much. I hope you're having a great weekend. So, he actually doesn't, he, he asked to connect to Josh, but here he just told me he sent in his resume. So, immediately, I sent a note to these guys saying, pay attention to this resume, don't let it get lost. Connected him to Josh. He had an interview there. Like, I just felt like hooking him up, and I did. And, um, Did he get a job? Hmm? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. But we've become friends. Yeah, and he's um, he's actually anyway he, he's still looking. Um, but now I'm like I don't know like I'm totally perfectly happy to help this guy. He's moving to New York in March for good, um, and he's a really interesting guy. And I just you know he's adding value as I help him. I'm enjoying the the relationship. So. Um, so that's it. This is my second to last slide. So when you have a door, you have to walk through. When you open a door, remember that you, you got to walk through, through it, so be sure it's a door you care to open. Um, and I think that was the lesson of my own journey was it's not enough to just learn to open doors. Like You may find yourself in a position where you can open doors and they're not the doors you want to be opening. Um, so there's a lot that has to go into finding, figuring out which doors you want to open. And when you do that work, they open much more easily and much more quickly and it's all much more gratifying. So um, that's it. And this is just to say that um, I'm always working on this myself. And the landscape is changing all the time. Um, you know, LinkedIn, like we've, you know, we've got all these new tools for getting to each other and asking for favors. And Josh asked some good questions about crowdsourcing and what's the future of that. And I think it's all sort of unresolved. And so we're, we're having to kind of make new rules as we go. Um, and I am, you know, uh, definitely no authority, I'm still a student. So, anyway, that's all I have to share um, tonight. Thank you. <laughs>